I grew up in uh, Overbrook, Philadelphia, which was in the very western edge of the city. My parents, we were, we'd say, a strong Catholic family. We grew up by ritual, but our, but our, our, our home base was Roman Catholicism. My mother uh, was uh, from upstate Pennsylvania, and her family was Byzantine Catholic. So we celebrated the liturgies and all the rituals in, in the church, in church Slavonic, which was the language of the liturgy, with all the Byzantine frills. So growing up, I grew up by ritually with my grandfather's sense of spirituality and my father's Irish kind of faith of Philadelphia, which tends to be a little conservative. So in a way, it's only upon reflection in later years that I realized that my grandfather had a great influence on my imagination. He helped me get beyond guilt and get beyond what a lot of people have in their lives that they carry over all the time because the Byzantine spirituality is so much fuller and it doesn't start with feeling bad about yourself but about feeling good about yourself and then finding the intersection between penance or, the, or penitential practices followed by true celebration. So we had both in our family and that was a very rich experience for me. Our neighborhood was a, a very mixed uh, neighborhood. Um, we had, it was very ecumenical. My, my best friend across the street was Jewish. We also had Protestants and Catholics. When we went bicycle riding, we went to the park. We went with the whole group. It wasn't like just the Catholics do this. So we learned early on that people are people. And so that was a, an element. In the summer, uh, in the parks of Philadelphia, there was a, a venue called Robin Hood Dell. The Dell is still used, the Dell is like a field, and it had a, um, a shell. And once, I don't know, I think it was Wednesdays at 11 o'clock, the Philadelphia Orchestra performed a, a morning children's, children's concerts. So we often went in the summer every Wednesday, packed our lunch, and enjoyed music, and then had lunch together in the park and then came home. It was a very nice way to spend the summer. So again, it, it's formation. It's, it, not, I didn't realize it, but it, I was being formed culturally. So music and dance and art and even painting were always part of our experience. So it's, it wasn't foreign. I didn't have to learn it later in life. It was already there. I also was an altar boy. And uh, the parish that I belonged to, Our Lady of Lourdes in Overbrook, the pastor was a former professor of liturgy. Actually, I had the same position, but 25 years later as a priest. And he was a real stickler about liturgy. So they were quite elegant liturgies, and he really worked at the liturgy. So I learned from the beginning about the detail, that liturgy just doesn't, you just don't throw things together, but it requires planning, care, and attention to detail. I think that was built into my experience as a kid, so it just seemed to be what you did. Philadelphia St. Charles Seminary was known as the West Point of Seminaries. Uh, this is 1963. Uh, it's, um, it's what you, if you wanted to be a priest, this is what you did. Even though I went to a Jesuit prep school and I had friends who were members of Gray Moor, and also I knew some uh, marital missionaries. Um, the, the tradition somehow in the city was you went to the diocesan seminary. So off I went, and it was a tough place. We, were, we had a lot of grand silence, which meant that we went to bed early. We were up very early, 5.30 in the morning. We used to line the hallways in our cassocks. It was freezing cold. The seminary was also a closed system. So that, for example, people, this would not be done today, but all of our mail was slid open. Some of the mail never got to us. And the newspapers were also censored and pieces of it were cut out. The education was, um, was very mixed in terms of uh, the standards. I mean, it, 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 they were good teachers, but um, a lot of them were very quirky and uh, we had to learn how to navigate uh, a lot of situations. In the midst of all that, I was very fortunate because I got permission 
uh, to begin studying outside the seminary, which was slightly unheard of. And I was able to go to the Annenberg School of Communications in, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Once a week, I would go into the city of Philadelphia to the College of UP in the midst of anti-war protesters, you name it. It was a hotbed. It was very liberal, pickets and I mean everything. And so that all spilled over into our lives. So that was kind of exciting to see what was happening on campus. Not that many people at the seminary had that experience. And then from there, I was able to go to um, Villanova University and I studied American literature and then history of theater. And then I took courses in playwriting. So that was part of my training. At the same time, I had gotten permission to study communications at the University of Notre Dame. So I went off to Notre Dame in the summers and studied, well, we began with public relations, but I primarily studied visual arts with a little bit of emphasis in architect. And then I also was in the Notre Dame uh, Drama Club. And I was also the director and founder of the Notre Dame Film Festival. So we had a film festival every year. I studied film, so I wrote reviews, published a little book. And so uh, at Notre Dame in the summers, we had movies three times a week. That was Notre Dame in the 60s. A lot of sisters, brothers, it was very, very religious bent. A lot of them never had a chance really to see movies or didn't get out to see movies sometimes, especially the sisters. So to see 18 films in the summer was really great. So we packed the theater three times a day. It was just, and it was so successful. And so I stayed on for two years as the director of the festival and then also taught at Notre Dame. I taught film theory and uh, my specialty was Fellini, Bergman, Truffaut, yeah, and the new French New Wave. So I was, very, I was very much involved in film culture. Even though I was a Philadelphian and was able to manage all this, I began to realize the real conflicts that I was perceiving and the difficulties I would personally have in the future. In later years, some of my good friends that were ordained a year or two ahead of me left soon afterward. They left a year after priesthood because it, it wasn't working for them. So I thought, well, this, this is not working for me at all. I was trying to figure out what to do and I was still having all these, I was still at Villanova and Penn, and so things were going. So it, it wasn't by necessity, but it was by opportunity that one of the Paulist fathers, Father John Collins, who was a classmate of mine in Overbrook years ago, joined the Paulist fathers. It just happened that he visited the seminary one evening on, when we came home from the apostolates, and he invited me to think about the Paulist Fathers, because we were, I was talking to him about trying to figure out what to do next, and that personally I was, this was conflicted and I didn't know. And so he presented a very nice view of the Paulist Fathers, so I then snuck to New York and met with Father Campbell and talked to the, I read everything about the Paulist Fathers, and the more I read, the more attracted I was. It just, it seemed like, it seemed like this is what I was looking for all along and didn't know it. So when I joined the community, that's what happened. I, I just, it was a very natural transition. And so I think my values and what I was about early on just got carried. I didn't have to relearn behaviors, but I had to submerge them for a long time publicly among you know, in the seminary. I was able to break free of all that with the Paulist Fathers and they were very open to accepting me. I was a little older. I mean, most of the guys then were in the 1920s. They were college kids. I had been, I was, I was through graduate. I had a graduate degree in theology, so I was at the other. I was ready for ordination. So, uh, but the whole community was very welcoming, and it was a very nice meeting. And uh, it just continued. I, I, I never looked back, and I, and I never looked back with any regrets. And eventually. Um, the seminary, I, I remember these stories now, but the whole experience just faded, and it just faded away, and this whole new life kind of opened up for me. One of the, my mentors at Notre Dame, who taught film studies, he was telling me that I should next look at dance, 
because he felt that dance is the closest medium to film and that theater is much different than film. So when he told me this, I said, well, I'm gonna start looking at modern dance. And eventually when I went to Ohio State to do my doctorate, I chose dance as one of the means of communications and got more involved. It took dance classes and took performance classes and took bar every day. And I was, at that time I was quite large. So I was a bit of a sight to be seen because I'm not as thin as I am now, but that's when I put my PhD together in terms of looking at, after all this other training, I said, well, you know, I've done, I've done uh, liturgical theology, I have that degree, I've done my degree, I have a fair amount of interest in understanding of theater, and I've done film, and then architectural design, so I decided to put it all together. I thought, I, I, rather than looking at them separately, to think organically. I did my PhD because dance was going to be a piece of the research. Uh, I ended up doing a participant observation study of two dance companies here in New York. So I came and lived here in New York for about six, seven months and spent the, the uh, daytime down in Soho uh, with a modern dance company. They invited me to come and work with them because I had video equipment. And the woman who was doing the big piece for the Brooklyn Academy of Music uh, needed to retrieve some of the visual material. So I became part of her staff. So I went, I went to every rehearsal for about four months. And, I, and then I also noted the, the process of dance making, the choreography and, in, in a, in a, and ritual. I was looking at ritual so that that became part of it. And on the other hand, I went uptown on, at nights and worked with Carla de Sola in the Cathedral of John the Divine with the Omega Dance Company. And I had known Carla for many years. So then my dissertation was about comparing, looking at ritual as a means of communication, how movement is part of that, and then describing in detail both the making of a, of a liturgical dance and the making of a modern dance, this, and com compare and contrast kind of thing. So, from the very beginning, that was what my interest was. I really wanted to do my dissertation about Africa, and my committee got on my, they were very tough on me. They said, you're not, you're staying put, you're gonna write this dissertation, you're not gonna be distracted. So I said, well, they're smarter than I am. So I followed their advice and did it. I did exactly what I was told to do I learned a lot in doing it. I learned a lot about dance and about interaction with people and uh, made a lot of friends in the dance world. And then when the time came for my sabbatical, I said, I am going to go to Africa and I'm gonna do this project. You have entered the dancing church. Well, you know, I was not that old. Secondly, I had never been to Africa. The computers, the computers weren't quite in yet. There was very little way of communicating with people. So bold as I am, off I went to Africa with my camera, six very heavy batteries, an electrical system that could probably power a small city, and me carrying everything. Uh, but of course, then it was not a, there was no digital cameras. I had this big VHS and the big tape. I had 20 tapes. You can imagine how heavy. That's why my clothing was not, I wore safari most of the time because there was no room in my bags for anything else. So I hand carried that. Everything was shot on location. I did, I arrived in Africa and then made contacts. I went from, I had, I had an international round the world airfare and just flew from each place. And when I got there, had to negotiate what I was doing. Some people knew I was coming, some didn't. It was like a surprise party. I started in Kenya because the Jesuits were there. I had a place to stay, and I knew they would help me make some other contacts, which they did. So I went to Kenya, but there, wasn't, there was some dance in Kenya, but I knew Kenya was not where, that wasn't where the action was. So I eventually got to Zaire, which was then Zaire, now it's Congo, uh, and it was the, that's where the Zaire Mass which was the first official ritual mass approved by Rome uh, since the very early liturgies. Here in another parish in Kinshasa at San Michel, 
we have the preparation for the reading of the gospel with the Alleluia. Notice the different kinds of vestments, the pattern of the dance, the repetition, and the discipline. Even within a very small amount of space, there is the concentration of the movement and the perfect uniform dancing. I was very concentrated on my research. So I wanted to get this material. I wanted that experience to be recorded. I really never thought about how dangerous or how crazy this whole idea was. It never, ever, thank God, if it did, I probably would have been paralyzed. But off I went, somewhat naive. And um, then people in other parts of Africa began hearing that I'm coming. And doors, I mean, it was, it just worked. The whole thing worked perfectly. But it was, to, it was a totally spontaneous seven months on the road by myself. And then I did the dancing church of South Pacific, including Melanesia, Polynesia. Then I went down to San Fernando Cathedral. And I was filming and watching material that totally blew me away. I mean, one after another was like, wow. And like, I, I couldn't even believe it was live or I was there. And um, one camera, so if you look at the material, um, the camera was pretty stationary all the time. I learned different editing techniques, and even friends of mine say, it doesn't look like a one camera job. It's not boring, because I'm able to do, I did some close ups. I, I, I knew though I couldn't play, I couldn't be too conscious in terms of the cinematography, or that's all you'd see is the, the effects. And, not, and with dance, you really have to be focused on the movement. You can't mess around with the feet and the body if you're gonna show it. And you have to see the context. You can do a close-up here and there, but you have to go back to the establishing shot. And so I got a phone call at my office. The woman identified herself as Sarah Caldwell, and I immediately like froze because Sarah Caldwell was the director of the Boston Lyric Opera Company, and she asked me if I would come down to see her, that she's doing a project and she needs help. So I came down to the Opera House, and I had a meeting with Sarah and Patricia Birch, who's a Broadway choreographer who was doing the choreography for Bernstein's Mass. So we talked about what they needed, and they needed somebody to do ritual actions. So the, the, the theater piece is basically the entire Mass, just as you would imagine it in a church with truncated variants, and there is a celebrant, and the celebrant goes from the beginning, and in this production, they, he, they keep adding on chasubles, the vestments, because he's being weighed down by all the tradition, and he's having faith issues, so that's, you have the mass theme on one level, and the beautiful music that Bernstein wrote, and then you have the reality of the question of faith and belief that runs through it on another level with the celebrant, which is what happens near the end. He has a breakdown. So I used to sit with uh, Miss Caldwell. Every, I went to every, every rehearsal. So I would come at seven in the evening and she would have the music rehearsal. The Ma Bernstein's Mass was a complicated piece. It involved a marching band, the full orchestra, a choral group of about 75 who were going to be embedded into the set in the back with all individually lit so that you could see their faces when they sang, a set, and then a, a, a rock and roll jazz band. This is Bernstein's great, I mean, that's why it's rarely done. It's very complex. After the first performance, friends of mine were in the audience and hadn't looked at the program. And one of my friends said, I wonder how they got this to look like a, this, there's not one step out of, it really had that feel. Then we, looked, then we read the program and we went, he's been here, he did his work. They didn't, they didn't, they looked, they didn't go far enough down in the credits to see my credit. So that, I, and then the Boston Globe in the review also mentioned the fact that it felt like a real mess, which I thought that was the highest praise. So I even got a little byline in the Globe. So it was a fun, very, it was a, a unique experience. I mean, how, how many times would a priest be invited to choreograph a major opera? <laughs> 
it's once in a lifetime memory. There's multiple levels of preparing a homily. So I think the first thing we have to talk about is the source material for a homily, which is generally uh, the scriptures. The first part about making a good homily is that it would be somewhat based on the, either the readings of the day or the scriptures if you're preaching on that particular, or if it's a feast day, on the event of Pentecost or something special. So you have the scriptural element, but then you have what is a homily about? A homily is about not, it's not a scripture class. You're not teaching people. What you're doing is you're taking the, you're crystallizing the truth, crystallizing the meaning of what the story is about as a way to help us understand what will help us today. So it's, it's the connection between the scriptures and today. I mean, famous priests used to say you preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And then how do you take your experience, the experience of God, and the experience of the community, and put them all in a blender? So you have some stories, you have relationships, and then you have whatever your theme is. The writing and the preparation of the homily is only part one. Part two is how then you present the homily in a public space. If I had a text, and I'm just reading the text, and every now and then I'm looking up, I'm not engaging the people. I'm certainly not embodied. And basically it's radio. So why not just get st stay, in the, stay in the sacristy and broadcast the homily? We don't, we don't need to see you. You know, I mean, just read it, read it that way. And, but it would be a disembodied voice. Here we have human encounter. That's what the, the liturgy is about, the encounter of God with the people. I think what um, traditionally drove the, the kind of the spirit of the Paulist Fathers is a sense of reunited in mission. For example, I think the Franciscans uh, come together to form community, and once they have community, then they do mission. We we ha we are missionaries. We're disciples in mission, and so we gather together and we we form a community. But our I think our driving individual force is to be missionaries, to spread the word and to be connected and in, 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 in use the contemporary means of communications, film, whatever, campus ministry in various ways to kind of reach out to people. But I think in general, um, Paul's fathers uh, are, are very welcoming and uh, uh, very caring. Uh, the other thing is I think Paul's fathers feel there's great support. In, in a way, I've, ex I've exhibited a fair amount of individuality in my life, but no one has ever not thought of me as a Paulist. Every now and then they'll kid me because I taught in the Jesuits for so long, they, they call me a closet Jesuit. But when I went, when I went teaching in other places, I learned very quickly that I'm not a Jesuit, I'm a Paulist, and that my whole way of being is very different. Different charism, different way of putting your life together, and different way of doing ministry, different way of finding God. So the spirituality, I think, of the Holy Spirit is another element that kind of, I think, warms us to a sense of community and encourages us in terms of our life together. About 20 years ago, to be exact, I really became very fascinated by this idea of pilgrimage. So I, I did a lot of research. I read anything I could on pilgrimage. Um, I studied various traditional pilgrimages and even went on one. I went on my very first Franciscan pilgrimage for 30 days that involved uh, Rome. And then we went off to Assisi. Then we went to a, a, a monastery. And it was a wonderful experience that I learned there a little bit about the actual, the interior feeling of, of, of pilgrimage. And I decided that as part of my ministry, I wanted to share that. I, I wanted to help people have that experience. Uh, this is, pilgrimage is very different than religious tourism. You can go to Rome and visit all the churches, 
and, 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 and even go to masses. But the, I think one of the differences is, as a pilgrim, you, you're going with more intentionality. So that, for example, the first thing to do when you enter a church is to enter quietly, stay with the group, and, and just be quiet and take in the church. Be attentive to what you see, maybe what you smell. Uh, if, if so, this is these are sometimes empty churches, but or if you had a liturgy, what are you seeing, and how are you participating, and to really get a sense of place first, and then there can be a lecture, or I we, I could share some I could talk about the history of the church or history of the statue or a painting, and get some kind of interesting detail about the place. Uh, we'd have a pilgrim prayer together. And then people can go around, take their pictures, visit the gift shop. But it's done with an intentionality of being a pilgrim in a space and respecting the space. Pilgrimage uh, and the effects of pilgrimage are not always obvious, even during the pilgrimage or even at the last day. And what happens, I think, sometimes is that seeds are planted or ideas are in your head or experiences and at a certain point you have that aha moment ah and things come together and you see relationships where you understand life with a deeper insight 